our second talk for the afternoon. Uh, it's RESTful APIs with Testify by uh, Daniel Lindsley. So. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, as Juan said, it's RESTful APIs with TastyPy, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the JSON. Uh, I'm Daniel Lindsley. I run a small web consulting shop called Toast Driven. I also do open source under that moniker. And I'm the primary author of TastyPy. So uh, what is TastyPy, you might be asking yourself. How many people have used TastyPy before? OK, cool. Uh, for the rest of you, TastyPy is a REST framework for Django. Uh, what that means is it cooperates with the RESTful, uh, the RESTful ideals described in the, some of the RFCs. Uh, it provides a web-based API on top of Django. Um, one of the differences that many people find when using TastyPy versus other API frameworks is this concept of being designed for extension. TastyPy was designed with you in mind, not just me. Uh, it supports supports both the ORM that comes with Django, as well as non-model data, so you can represent all kinds of data, not just things coming out of Postgres or MySQL, but things like NoSQL, log-based stores, RPC, all kinds of things you can wrap in them. And you can find more details out on the official website at tastypyapi.org. So first, I want to talk a little bit of philosophy so that we're all on common ground, because RESTful can mean different things to a lot of different people. Um, first is this idea of making really good use of HTTP. The RFC specs for HTTP were written with servers in mind so that you could control data and re fetch resources across the network. That's how all the main web servers work, and that's how our API should ideally work. Um, there's lots of things that have been defined in the RFCs that, like using proper rest me RESTful methods. Git should be idiopotent. It should not try to modify data on the server. Posts should be creating, et cetera, et cetera using proper status codes so that you don't just get a generic 400 error anytime anything blows up, because that doesn't help anyone. Uh, there's this concept of graceful degradation. So your API should probably be backward compatible, because not everyone can upgrade the moment you want them to upgrade. So being able to support people who are on an older version of the API or to handle gracefully changes in it is very useful for people who have rarely changing clients. Uh, the concept of flexible serialization, because not everybody wants JSON. Some people's toolkits are better to support YAML or, JSON, or uh, XML. Um, in the case of iOS, there's binary plists. There's lots of other options. But you know what? That's not enough. Why not do flexible everything? Because you're trying to produce the best possible thing for a client to consume. They don't know anything about your code base. They don't know anything about your data. All they have is this HTTP interface to get things out of. So customizability should be a core feature for both you as a developer using TastyPy, as well as for people on the other end fetching the data. Um, there's a not as often used principle as I would like, uh, is this concept of round trip ability of your data. The idea here is that if you can get something from a web service, you ought to be able to push that same exact data back to the web service and have the same kind of object or resource created on the other end. Um, this helps discoverability a lot. It helps documentation. It helps clarify what things can come in and out of your API. Uh, there's the concept of reasonable defaults. This is a little bit more specific to you know, API frameworks as opposed to uh, the actual client. But you want things to be easy for other people to use. Because the harder your API is to use, the more likely others on the client end, or you in, as the implementer, are going to hit problems. URIs everywhere. We want HADOWAS to be persistent throughout. HADOWAS, if you've never heard of the acronym, means hypermedia as the engine of application state. Um, what this really means is that you should be able to hit an API, just one endpoint at the highest level, and have enough information provided back to you to be able to explore the entire rest of the Git interface and be able to read basically all the data that's available to you without documentation, without prior knowledge of the structure or anything, because you get URIs back. And, you can, and as a client to the API, the people you're designing your API for, they can just follow right in 
and keep digging through and explore. Just like you use the Python REPL to explore features of libraries that you may be using, having URIs everywhere makes it easy for your API to be explored. So what about TastyPy? He can't have any pie, but you can. Uh, TastyPy builds on top of the facilities that are built into Django. Um, the idea is that it is a third-party app. You should be able to download it, and it should play nicely with all the other apps in the Django ecosystem. Um, we try to follow full HTTP CRUD style methods, git post, put, delete, patch. Uh, for those who don't know, git is equivalent to reading. Post is generally create. Put is update. Delete is delete. <laughs> And Patch is a uh, non-official extension to the RFC that lets you do more advanced things. Um, there's this concept of, of being available for any data source. Lots of people choose to expose the ORM, but you may not want to expose your database structure, or it may not make sense to expose that structure to a client who's consuming your API. And of course, we've already covered design to be extended. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Out of the box, you get a wide variety of serialization formats, uh, JSON, XML, YAML for those dirty Ruby types, uh, and binary plists for your iOS developers who get a big, big performance boost out of using plists. HadoOS is the default, which we'll see in a few minutes. And uh, when I was talking about having it being designed for extension, there's tons and tons of places throughout TastyPy that you should be able to extend the built-in API without having to touch the source code of TastyPy at all. Um, it's pretty well tested, hovers at about 80% coverage, um, roughly three and a half thousand lines of test code, and it's pretty decently documented, and that's getting better all the time. So for those of you who have never used TastyPy before, let's talk about a sample setup. Uh, installation is pretty easy. You just pip install Django TastyPy. Um, you, know, you really ought to be using pip. Please don't easy install. Uh, once it's installed, you simply add the TastyPy app to installed apps. You don't have to use list concatenation. Just feel free to put it in the main list in your settings and run manage.pysyncdb. That's it. So now that we have it, we probably want to try and apply it. So the most common thing that most people have installed in their Django applications is contrib auth. So let's try and set up a contrib auth instance. Uh, at a high level, like I said, you should not be modifying TastyPy's code unless you have patches you want to submit upstream. Everything should be doable from your code. So it's going to go in your apps, not in Django. We're going to def simply define a, user, or a resource for our user model and hook it up in the URL conf. So do not fork Django. Just because it's in contrib auth, I don't want to see any of you forking Django to do this code. Do not do it. What you really should be doing is within your project or your application, go into the app, make a directory, touch init.py so that it's a regular Python module, pretty standard, and then touch API resources.py, and that's enough for the setup in that regard. To actually hook it up to a user, we import user from its standard place, and then we import model resource from TastyPy. We define a user resource class that inherits from model resource, which will handle some introspection, and then we define this, this very familiar inside meta class that's used in many places in Django and set up a query set to point to all users. Now that we're done with our resource, we just simply hook that resource up in the URL conf. A common way to do this is to have a core API object which is used to collect all these resources and to make the, the HadoOS bits of this work. You register your resource instance and hook up the URLs in the patterns. And you've created your first API. You can now hit it in the browser, so we'll do a little quick demo of that. Uh, over here, I've got a Django instance with the code we've got. At the highest level, we've got slash API v1. The format equals JSON is not required. We'll get into that in a moment, but for the browser, we're going to use it. We get a list of the endpoints that are, that are available in this API, and we see this slash user here. So we're going to go to slash user and follow where that link points. That leads us to a list view. We get a paginated list by default and a list of our objects. And as you can see, there's my user record. Well, there's this resource URI in here that points to this slash one at the end, so let's follow that in. And now you get a, just a bare detail view, like you might expect. 
So with just that little bit of code that we just got done using, what's there are the following things. Like I said, at slash v1, that v1 is a configurable default in the API class. It's a way to namespace your APIs so that you can support a v2 or a v3. Or maybe you don't like v whatever and you want to have a different kind of naming scheme or handle URIs a different way. Maybe you need a different base path. Whatever you need, you should be able to do. Uh, slash users within that has a list of all the users. Obviously, there's a detail view. The interesting ones that we haven't seen are the schema view and the multiple endpoints. Schema will return a serialized format of all the fields that appear on that resource, as well as definition inf information like defaults, does it allow blank, what type are we usually getting out of that field, et cetera, et cetera. The multiple lets you specify as many non-contiguous PKs as you want. It's basically a fast way to get a lot of data that isn't conveniently filterable. Uh, as I said, all serialization formats are available. So if we go back to the browser, we can pop in XML, and we get back XML without having to change anything. If we do YAML, oops, there turns out there's an A there. We've got a download. And if we open that up, we have valid YAML. Uh, and of course, binary plist is there too. It looks honestly kind of just like gibberish, but it's downloaded and it, uh, yeah. Isn't that helpful? I'd love to debug this. So anyway, <clears throat> now in order to have, excuse me, uh, in order to get those formats to work, you do need to have LXML, PyYAML, and this fantastic library called BIPList installed. But they're very easy to install. They generally install cleanly everywhere. And it's a nice touch to be able to add extra options for other people. Uh, as I said, we use that format equals JSON in the URL for the browser because browser accepts headers send that they want XML ahead of application JSON. So if, if I hadn't had that uh, format equals JSON in there, we probably would have gotten XML back by the default, even though that's not what it, the default for the resource is. TastyPipe would rather that you send the accepts header, because that way you can specify a nice range of different content types that you might or might not want, and whatever can be satisfied first is what will be served. Uh, pagination is the default, because honestly, I don't think anyone wants to hit a list endpoint and get 100,000 records and sit and wait for all the serialized objects. Uh, but it is possible to get that. And of course, built in is this read-only get access. Now, we ha do have some problems. If you're paying attention, we're leaking some information that maybe we don't want to leak over the internet, like, oh, I don't know, my email. Please don't spam me. Uh, my password, so I hope you don't have photographic memory and have my SHA memorized. Um, and some other uh, Django-specific options. There's we're lacking the ability to filter right now. All we can really get is the full list of things and go page by page. We don't have any authentication or authorization in place. Caching is disabled by default for good reason. And throttling is, there's no throttling there. So our servers can get you know, trashed and we can't do anything about it. So let's fix those. Uh, fixing the data leaks is easy. Uh, there's a meta option called excludes. We just give it a string list or a list of strings of field names we don't want to show up. Authentication asks the question: Are you a recognized user? Are you present in in this case in the Django users table, or you know maybe you have LDAP authorization or I'm sorry authentication or some other mechanism? So we just want to know: Are you able to get into this system? Adding that is easy. We have all the same things in the meta as we did before, but now we import this basic authentication class which puts HTTP basic auth on the resource. That's now powered off the username and password from the users table. Filtering is also simple. We define a filtering meta option and hand it a dictionary. The keys are all the fields that, you're that you can filter on. Uh, in this case, we use the special constant all to say, hey, the list of filter types that Django supports is really, really big, and it sucks to type out. Just support all the ORM methods. If that doesn't suit your needs, you can provide a list that just says, hey, only range greater than, less than, and the equal variance are OK for this field type. And now, using that, those filtering options that we just specified, 
you can put curl in and say, hey, only usernames that start with A or only dates that date joins that are greater than December of last year. Authorization is one that people often get confused. Authentication just says, do we know who you are? Authorization says, can you do that? You're okay, we know who you are, but I'm not sure you're allowed to save that object. Uh, adding authorization, again, equally simple. We're gonna toss in this authorization option with, that points to Django authorization that performs checks on the user against the permissions table that comes with contrib auth. So anything they can do from the Django admin, they now can do through your API. And if they don't say, for instance, have delete user permission, they can't do it through the API either. Caching, again, more of the same. We define a cache option. There's the simple cache class that's included with TastyPy. Uh, it, we're gonna talk a little bit more about caching in a few minutes because that's important when you start talking about APIs and machines consuming APIs. This isn't like web pages where somebody clicks every 10 seconds. You can be flooded very, very easily. And on the topic of being flooded, there's the throttle implementations. Our TastyPy ships with a couple different throttle variants. This one is an example of using CacheDB, which will uh, essentially do write through and log user accesses to a table. So what we have now is everything that we had on the previous slide and the previous time we asked what was there. We also now have full CRUD access to our API. Only registered users can use this now and only work with the things that they are allowed to. Object level caching, just at the Git detail level. And the CacheDB throttle will now limit each user to 150 requests per hour. Again, this is configurable through uh, quarks to the CacheDB throttle class. And we can now filter. So, I'd like to kind of go back to a little bit more philosophy and talk about extensibility because this is something that comes up a lot with TastyPy. The goal of the project was to give the people implementing APIs lots and lots of tools and a, lot, and a very easy way to extend things when they don't meet their needs. So if you've been watching the slides, you might be wondering why are there so many classes? Is this guy crazy? No, I'm not object-oriented crazy. What it does is it, lets, it puts the tools in your hands to easily implement different functionality. Why so many classes? We just had a wide variety of things that we set up as meta options. I believe that composition is much more powerful than inheritance, so having a lot of small classes that enable interchanging behaviors very easily is much stronger than trying to do a lot of mix-ins or having just one really, really big resource that now you have to pick apart all kinds of crazy things with him. An example of composition being used is things like the dunder methods in Python, where you'll call, say, len of a list, and it'll actually call the dunder len method on the list object. That's an example of composition and delegation. Uh, and why so many methods? If you go dive through the docs or through the source code, you'll find that resource has just a ton of methods. It was done so that you have plenty of hooks to be able to change behaviors without having to copy paste huge swaths of code and swap them out. Uh, TastyPy does try to use reasonable defaults. We think most people like JSON and that you, you probably want full CRUD and all these other things. But like I've said, your mileage may vary. So making it easy for you is one of the big priorities. Um, we already covered a lot of the classes that come with TastyPy and enable the changing isolated behaviors. And these, all of these classes have default implementations that are present but are pretty short and pretty easy to swap out with things that suit your needs better. And again, keeping with the concept of composition and delegation, Resource has lots of methods that then call out to those classes. So you can have a custom authentication class, say your, your needs are better suited by OAuth2, which for instance isn't included because it's not final yet. Uh, you can have cases where specific resources will be able to skip those things based on just method implementations rather than swapping things out. So as an example of how we can customize things, let's talk about customizing serialization. By default, we supported these formats, 
But let's say we want to trim it down to JSON and XML, and then we're going to add a whole new type that isn't present anywhere. Customizing things down, this is a very common thing people want. They just want JSON and XML because they don't have anyone consuming YAML or binary plists, and they want to save themselves some hassle of setup, save some possible security risks, et cetera, et cetera. Formats is easy. You simply pass quarks and say, hey, just JSON or XML. So what, uh, what serialization format should we add? Any thoughts? We've got, we've got JSON, XML. <laughs> oh, I wish I had done Lolcat. Let's do HTML. Uh, so using very standard Django things, we're going to import rendered response because we're going to be rendering a template with some context. And we add on to the formats this HTML option, which basically says, hey, if the person is requesting a, a accept header with, uh, wow, text HTML. Man, my mime type's horrible. Uh, if they request HTML, this serializer should be able to support that. If not, it should fall back to other options. Uh, we define a two HTML method, which says, hey, we're sending data out. We need to take this rich Python model and send it out as HTML. Uh, pick a couple template names. We're going to look at if objects is in data to figure out if it's a list view or not. And we just render the template as normal. Getting data back from the user is a little more complex. Uh, we're going to have to import CGI and string IO because we're getting XWW form encoded data. So we just set up a CGI field store using pretty standard stuff to read that form, that form data back, and we set up a dictionary for ourselves based on those keys. Obviously, if you put this in production, you probably want some more checks and, and a little bit more detail to flesh this out, but this is an example of implementation. And then hooking it up is easy. We just import our serializer from where we put it in our, in our uh, application and then set it up as the serializer object with the proper formats, and we're done. So I'm, I mentioned earlier that um, TastyPy tries to not be tied to the ORM. Um, something you haven't seen so far is this concept of customizing the representation that comes back. Maybe you don't want to show everyone what's in your database, or maybe your database structure doesn't make sense for someone consuming the API. So what you can do is you can use fields to customize how the data is presented to the, your clients. Uh, just like things like model forms or forms or models, you can control what's exposed on these resource objects using fields. And just like Django, you use a very familiar declarative syntax. So in this case, uh, user objects in Django have this get full name method. It's an attribute uh, hanging out on the user object. So we're going to set up a full name field that's included on our user resource. We put in, it's a, it's a character field, and get full name is a callable, which TastyPy can automatically handle. So we just pass in the method name as the attribute to be accessed. And it could be blank if they haven't filled in their username and pa or first name and last name. So we, leave, we allow for that. Similarly to form, you can also control how things are presented. In TastyPy, it's called the hydrate and dehydrate cycles. Um, this is roughly analogous to form clean. If anyone has done advanced uh, form, custom or form customizations, you'll find a lot of similarities here. And what dehydrate and hydrate let you do is they let you take this rich data model that you have. You've, you've got a model object with lots of methods and lots and lots of fields straight out of your database. And what you need to send across to the user is a very thin serialized piece of data with very simple types. They're kind of different, and being able to map between them is what hydrate and dehydrate let you do. Dehydrate controls going from the rich object to the skinny serialization, and hydrate goes the opposite way, taking that skinny serialization and making it a full-fledged model again. Uh, when you set the attribute, like the get full name earlier, it's automatically handled by TastyPy to just call the at or either access the attribute or call it if it's callable. But you can provide methods on your resource that do more advanced things. So for instance, the get full name method on user can't handle data coming back. It's strictly only for presentation. So if you had this on your resource, a user might try and send get or full name as part of a post, and it would fail miserably on them. 
So what we do is the, we're defining a dehydrate full name and hydrate full name methods to handle this cycle. The dehydrate full name actually isn't required for this example because of the attribute access, but for demonstration purposes, it's basically just dehydrate underscore and then the field name. We get this bundle, which is a collection of all the data associated with the request, and we simply just call the full name. It's exactly what the attribute access would have been doing, but is the more verbose. Um, is the more verbose way of putting it. Uh, similarly, hydrate full name is them sending full name and it's coming back into your API. Since Django doesn't provide any functionality for trying to figure out a first name and last name, we simply just access the data that's coming back from the user, which is a dictionary. We try and get full name out of it if it's there, split it up to, and assume that whatever comes out of that white space split, the first part of it is the first name and whatever's left is the last name. Very simplistic, but should suit this example. And this is just like the barest, uh, barest demonstration of hydrate and dehydrate. You can do full data-wide changes, you can modify all kinds of things, and it is a very powerful thing to be able to add. And what you're not seeing is that all these fields that we saw in the example were already introspected for you by model resource. Serious? Okay. So, questions? Do you have a little stuff left, or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can I cruise through just some highlights yeah. real quick? Okay, so uh, caching. Caching is very simple in TastyPie. It's intentionally simple because it's very complex and it, uh, it you, you, have a hard time generalizing it. So what you should be doing is you should be using Varnish. It's a super fast caching reverse proxy written in C. It does a great job handling Git requests and already handles all the complexities that could be involved with complex URIs and request headers and whatnot. Um, you didn't get to see it, but TastyPy can also be used with non-ORM data sources. If you hit up the docs, there's an example that connects it up to Reoc, which is a NoSQL data store. Um, a lot of this seemed like it would be really, really useful and not very Django specific. So uh, at the end of last year, I actually tried to extract out those common, like these common non-Django specific things into something that all Python web frameworks could use. It failed kind of miserably for a variety of reasons that I'd be happy to talk about afterward. And we'll call that good. So thank you very much. Questions? If there's questions, there's a microphone here. So if you have a question, please walk down to the microphone. What was the monospace typeface that you used? Uh, <laughs> Easy one. That's Monifer. Uh, I have a question about uh, the permission framework. Uh, is, are you able to have complex permissions that depends on the context, for example, if I'm a user that can delete only the post that I have created, mm -hmm. uh, is that possible? It is possible. There is some, uh, most people refer to that as role level permissions, yes. um, and there's a huge variety, obviously, of complex things on top of that. It's doable right now with not a lot of code. There's a uh, branch in the works that's gonna make it even better. So yes, it is possible. Thank you. Yep. Could you tell us a little more about the non-ORM part of the API? So just where, so what if I don't actually have a right. model underneath it, I'm just pulling data from somewhere else. Sure, so uh, model resource, if you go source dive, this was in the slides that I didn't get to. If you go source dive into uh, tastypyresources.py, you'll find that comparatively model resource is tiny because all it really does is just works with the ORM. And outside of that, everything else is handled in this, is in this more generic resource class. And you can apply it to pretty much any data source by just implementing like a couple methods. Like implementing full get support is overriding three methods. Hi. Um, quick question can you regarding. Speak into the mic a little. Oh. Yeah. Quick question regarding um, versioning. I think. Mm -hmm. 
you seem to prefer to put uh, version numbers in the URI that you're requesting. How do you feel about that versus specifying that in the headers? Um, there is a pull request on headers. I don't know how I feel. Um, on the one hand, headers, like I don't really know what's gained by doing headers over the URL other than like maybe your URL looks slightly cleaner or like, like a, an argument a lot of people use is that you know, they don't have to, the clients don't have to go through and change a whole bunch of URLs in their application. And to me, that should already be a, a global or a configuration thing that's already only in one place because the root is always the same for all of these things. Um, what I like about the non-header based approach is that it's immediately obvious in the URL what version you're getting and it's, it's very, it's explicit and takes not a lot of work with other libraries or extending things. So it's mostly a convenience and clarity thing. Like those, those URIs that, that TastyPie uses all throughout it, if you're relying on headers, now there's some question of like, are you mixing and matching things? Are you accessing a newer API than you intended to by accident when you're like, if you're just clicking through or if there's an error in the code, you might, you know, you find cases where you may be crossing API versions. So that, that's how I feel, but um, if nothing else, making it easy to do the header-based approach is high up on the list. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Uh, picking up on the header uh, question, mm -hmm. um, what do you, how do you feel about sticking to uh, Roy Fielding's uh, you know, original RESTful approaches? Because we have sort of uh, been like going away from it. And mm -hmm. I, I see that as a practical approach to go away from the, uh, his original you know, ideas. But how do you feel about it being the you know, developer of TastyPie? I tend to take a, a pragmatic approach to it. Where it makes sense, I'd rather stick to REST because for, for all the shortcomings, it's at least reasonably well-defined and many people agree on at least the, the big picture portions of it versus things like RPC and SOAP, which can be, you know, whatever. So uh, where possible, I try to stick to REST. Now that being said, if you have, you know, custom behavior, like you do need to make some kind of like RPC call or you have something that isn't like RESTful, you're not modifying data specifically, but maybe making some kind of atomic operation, Adding endpoints is as simple as implementing a base, uh, or is as simple as implementing a override URLs method, and then just defining another method on your resource that's like um, get underscore comments or something like that. So generally, try to stick to REST as much as possible, and then where I find it doesn't suit my needs, that's when I'll deviate into other things. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, what's the difference between the latest uh, beta version and the release version? More, uh, the latest trunk, or not trunk, I'm sorry, the latest Git master is not wildly different from the most recent release, which was uh, 0 0.9.11. Uh, the idea was that actually this should have been version one a while ago. Uh, there is a release in progress uh, for releasing an updated version which addresses some security issues uh, and a couple other patches. Uh, the roadmap to V1 is uh, marked on GitHub and it's basically just things that are, uh, I'm not comfortable with committing to backward incompatibility at this point. So using Git master versus the last release is not wildly different. Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions. So I wanna thank Daniel for an excellent talk. Thank you.